The history of the Eastern Roman Empire, aka Byzantium, from the fall of Rome to the fall of Rome number 2, Constantinople, is a story of a constant decadence, losses and defeats alternating with small rises and successes, which nevertheless never brought the country to pre-crisis levels. In its thousand years of decline, the margin of strength of the Hellenistic Empire was enormous, there was many such glimmers of hope and even more opportunities for them. My name is Jacob and I welcome you to the Synthetic History channel, where we talk about events that didn't happen as if they did. And today I will tell you the story of how the last such opportunity laid the foundation for the rebirth of the Empire, and the story of this rebirth, using mod Mayo and Texas 3.0 for Europa Universalis 4. The link to the mod will be in the description. This mod fits much better than vanilla EU4 for my stories, as it has a pretty solid simulation of the world and the processes that was going on in that era. The mod deepens the gameplay a lot, and in short, it turns EU4 into what should have been Victoria 3, so don't be surprised by what is happening on the screen. I will tell you everything you need to know anyway. So, the phoenix will rise from the ashes in EU4. 1357. The Roman Empire was in a miserable condition. The country was ruined by failed wars with its neighbors and constant internecine strife, shrunk to the size of Thrace and was under threat of invasion by the Turks. Constantinople, which in the previous century had a population of half a million, now had not even a hundred thousand. The whole population of the empire, or rather what was left of it, suffered from starvation and diseases. With the unseasoned wars, the Greek peasants were not even able to sow and harvest. How did the empire get to this point? To put you in historical context, I would like to begin the story with the last major defeat of the Roman Empire, which effectively ended its existence for more than half a century. The ill-fated Fourth Crusade of 1202-1204. So how could the crusade have harmed the Christian state? Well, originally the crusaders were going to invade Egypt, the main economic center of the Islamic world. But because of the fact that out of the planned 30,000 men, only 12,000 arrived to Venice, whose ships it was decided to use, they did not have enough money to pay the Venetians. The Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, offered the crusaders a simple and effective solution. The then Roman Emperor, Alexius III Angelus, was a usurper who overthrew his brother Isaac, and the empire itself was in social and political crisis. The latter's fleeing son, also Alexius, fled to Europe and began begging the local rulers for help in restoring power, promising a generous reward. So, it was possible to restore the power of the deposed emperor and receive from him in gratitude the means to continue the crusade. It was decided to do so. In June 1203, the crusaders sailed into Constantinople and began a brief and fairly successful battle for the city. On hearing the news, Alexius III fled, and the citizens of the capital released the captive former emperor. This by no means suited the crusaders, for they were then losing the enormous money promised them by his son. Under pressure from the Crusaders, Alexius IV was declared Emperor, and for about five months there was a joint reign of father and son. The younger Alexius made every effort to collect the sum needed to pay off the Crusaders, so that the population suffered enormously from the extortions. As a result, in January of the following year, the embittered citizens overthrew both Emperors. Their relative came to power and the crusaders, still in Constantinople, were fed up with it all, and in April occupied and sacked the city. This was the end of the glorious Fourth Crusade. The campaign to Egypt was postponed until the Second Coming, if anything it was a joke. As a result, the Roman Empire was abolished, the Latin Empire, led by Baldwin of Flanders, was set up in its place and large territories that did not recognize the authority of foreigners broke away from this new state. 
One of these territories was the so-called Nikea Empire, located in Asia Minor. These guys liked to call their states the size of Ireland empires. So it was it. Despite its unenviable position between the hammer in the form of the Latin Empire and the anvil in the form of the Turkish Sultanate of Rome, which was to return the old lands. How did they do it? There were several reasons. First, the Nikea Empire was a militaristic state, which through a system of military settlers, the Akritai, roughly speaking armed peasants, held back the Turks in the east. Second, the unsustainability of the Latin Empire as a state. The combination of European feudalism and Roman bureaucracy, multiplied by Venetian commercial and political influence, clearly did not offer much promise. By the second quarter of the century, the Latin Empire had lost most of its possessions in Asia Minor and Europe. Third, the Mongols. At this time, they had just invaded Anatolia and conquered Rome. The Eurida state continued to exist, but under Mongol rule it posed no threat to Nikea. Thus, the rulers of the latter were given every opportunity to restore the empire. And it happened. In 1246 they defeated the Bulgarians and seized substantial lands in the Balkans. And already under Michael VIII Paleologos, the founder of a new dynasty, in 1261 essentially a couple of hundred soldiers took Constantinople without a fight. Michael soon declared himself Autocrator, Emperor of Rome. And it would seem everything was now settled, the empire was saved, but the problems with the capture of Constantinople only grew. To invade the city they needed a fleet. And Michael made a treaty with Venice's main rival, Genoa. In exchange for their fleet, the Genoese received trade privileges and trading posts in the Aegean and the Black Seas. This contract was a deal with the devil for Rome. The country's economy has lost a lot from the monopoly of the Genoese. And the most frustrating thing is that Michael did not need a fleet. As I said, the city fell without a fight. The attitude of the Catholic world to Rome deteriorated greatly. In 50 years everyone had kind of grown used to the fact that Constantinople was theirs. But in fact the Europeans were not really a threat to the empire. No one wanted to fight for this city. But it's clear to us that they were no longer a threat, while Michael thought otherwise. Most of the army and funds were sent to the European direction. And in general, the Asia Minor part of the empire was let loose. The system of Akritai, disloyal to the new dynasty, Michael, previously just a regent for the young emperor, in fact, simply usurped the throne, was dissolved. There started Turk raids, and large taxes were collected from the local population for the reconstruction of the capital. The Paleologi, having returned to Constantinople, again began to focus on the aristocratic bureaucracy, ignoring the interests of the peasants. All this clearly did not help the rebuilding of the empire. Over 40 years, the country experienced several revolts, did not regain any new lands, and by the 14th century lost most of Asia Minor, where after the actual collapse of the Rome Sultanate formed a whole bunch of Beyliks, Turkish principalities fighting among themselves and with the empire for land. And often the local cities surrendered to the Turks without a fight, preferring to live under their rule. And this situation speaks volumes. The most powerful of these principalities was the Ottoman Beylik, which by 1336 had conquered most of the remaining eastern lands of the empire and threatened the European part of the country. Since the 1300s, the country roads in neglected and poorly guarded eastern trace were flooded by nomadic bands of independent Turks and Turkmens, who were landed by Turkish pirates and who plundered settlements and food carts bound for Constantinople. Then the Serbs came to the party as well. Their ruler, Stefan Dushan, launched an invasion of Rome and declared himself emperor of the Serbs and Greeks. He was able to subdue Bulgaria and seize vast lands in the south as far south as Attica, which was still under European control. 
However, the Greek population did not really like this upstart barbarian. The cities rarely surrendered without a fight and rebelled at the first opportunity. Ironically, the attitude towards the Muslim Turks was better than towards the Slavic brethren, who until recently were subjects of the empire. The former occupied Gallipoli in 1355, taking advantage of the earthquake that destroyed the wall of the local fortress and gained control of the Hellespont Strait. Nor should we forget the Black Death pandemic, which was just at the time sweeping across Europe. In general, the empire was on the verge of death. But it was not destined to die, exactly the opposite. And so we return to January 1357, which is considered the year of the beginning of Rome's revival. By 1357, the then Emperor John V was able to get rid of his pro-Turkish co-emperor regent and become the sole ruler of the empire. The system of co-emperors, by the way, which had existed almost since the 3rd century and was created to prevent tyranny and improve the succession of power, as if you die and your son had already ruled before your death, the chance of him being overthrown was reduced. Quite reasonable. In fact, it only increased the number of civil wars and coups. Because when two people have unlimited power, any conflict between them is a priori unresolvable from the outside. Anyway, in 1357, the opportunity for Rome to regain the land in the Balkans presented itself. The cool Stefan died, and the civil war broke out between his son and brother. In February, John declared war on Serbia. Roman troops defeated the Serbs sent here and besieged the city of Woden. The empire did not fear a step in the back from the Turks. In exchange for naval help in saving Ottoman prince Halil, they promised the truce Rome needed. Halil was betrothed to John's daughter and was in fact a pro-Roman candidate for heir to the Beylik. And the betrothed, by the way, were cousins. Thus, Rome tried to intermarry with the Ottomans and thus absorb them and there was a real chance of forming some kind of Roman-Turkish symbiosis. Halil never became the heir, though, and the symbiosis did not happen. But it was not important for the future of Rome. After the capture of Woden and the several more victories over the Serbs, they agreed to return the lands of Macedonia to the Empire. John immediately declared war on the second weakened Serbian faction and took control of central Greece without a fight. Within three years, the empire had regained most of the lands it had lost ten years earlier. Serbia, where the civil war had ended, still had a decent amount of power, but it was not a clear threat. In addition, the alliance concluded with Bulgaria strengthened the country's defenses, both against the Serbs and against the Turks. The latter, learning about the strengthening of Rome, were preparing for a major war. In June 1362, it began. Thanks to the support of the Bulgarians, the forces were roughly equal. Because of this, no one wanted to initiate a general battle, and the course of the war was determined by who would be the quicker to seize the fortresses and cities. However, since the most important cities of both sides were either coastal or fairly close to the sea, the navy played a very important role in this war, and the Roman fleet was more powerful. The following year, the capital of the Ottomans, the city of Prusa, fell. Under this case, realizing that there was a real chance of defeating the most successful Beylik, the Eretnids entered the war against the Ottomans, and a year later the Karaman also joined this war. The new ruler of the Ottomans, Murat, who killed his brother, the very same Halil, and declared himself the first Ottoman Sultan, was furious at such a blow and decided to troll all his forces against them. Because of this, he made considerable concessions to John, who might have wanted to continue the war, but couldn't lead it further. He was running out of money and manpower. So that peace can be said to be a life-saving, and as it turned out later, a turning point in the history of Rome. The coastal strip of the Sea of Marmara was returned to the Empire, so now Trace was protected from the raids of the Turks. The population of the empire was finally able to return to normal life, and the revenues to the treasury exceeded expenditures. 
with the return of full control of the straits between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. The Venetians offered the Emperor money for trade privileges. Although the agreement was not very profitable in the long term, to say the least, it could be compared to taking out a loan with perpetual interest. Money for economic recovery, especially in agriculture, people were dying of hunger even in rural areas, to say nothing of the cities, were needed now. Besides, the Genoese held a de facto trade monopoly on the Black Sea. So competition was not superfluous. For those who don't know why all traders were so eager to get to the Black Sea, the northern branch of the Silk Road ended there. And from the Genoese ports, such exclusive Chinese goods as silk, porcelain and plague made their way to Europe. However, it did not take long for these merchant republics to enjoy their privileges on a historical scale. But for now, let us return from economics to war. By becoming a more or less decent state again, the empire was able to improve the quality of the army. Now it was possible to recruit not just anyone, but to create normal military districts, establish hierarchy, standardize equipment and so on. In 1370, war broke out with the Catholics a fragment of the Latin Empire and the Hospitaller Order, for control of the agency. The war lasted three years and ended with the battle for the island of Rhodes and the subsequent successful siege of the local citadel. Rome regained Attica and a large part of the coast of Asia Minor, which the order had wrested from the local bailiffs. The money taken from them was used to restore the infrastructure of the capital, to complete the reconstruction of the system of military administrative districts, the FIMS, which had been abolished after the Fourth Crusade, and with the return of the possessions in Asia Minor, to restore the estate of the Akritai on the border with the Turks. In 1380, John, together with Bulgaria, launched a war against Serbia and Wallachia. The Serbs decided to concentrate their efforts on Bulgaria, which was to the advantage of the Romani who would leave them to fight alone, and themselves went to besiege cities in Macedonia and Albania. In the end, Bulgaria came out of the war weakened and ruined, and the empire returned to its borders before the Serbian invasion. After this victory, John, with a large pool of popular support, reformed the system of succession to the throne. The institution of co-emperors, the cause of many coups and revolts, was abolished at the low level. The election of the emperor, albeit symbolic, was abolished, and the eldest son always became heir to the throne, a familiar practice for European monarchs. That same year, Rome began a new war for the final liberation of the Asian coast against the Ottomans, at that time still strong adversaries. Murat was able to defeat the backstabbing Beliks, and the Ottomans became the de facto leaders in Anatolia. But he died, and his rather mediocre son took the throne. This war was fought with mixed success. At first, the Roman armies occupied the territories they wanted and in the following year defeated the armies of the Turks and their allies. But becoming overconfident from their victories, they rushed to defeat the remnants of the Turkish army at the same Nicaea from which the revival of the empire began and were ambushed there. Because of this defeat, the war dragged on for another three years. For the emperor, victory in the war was extremely important, and in order to obtain funds for its continuation, a tax reform was carried out, and trade privileges were sold to another Italian republic, Ancona. Several more battles followed, in which the Romans won, and with the besieging of Ankara, the Turks agreed to a peace treaty by which they gave up their coastal lands and paid Rome a hefty contribution. Making the most of the alliance with the Bulgarians, John broke it. After all, the Bulgarians were as yesterday's subjects of the empire as were the Serbs. And having finally gained strength, Rome was preparing to bring Bulgaria back into its fold. Poland, the dominant power in Eastern Europe, had by then become Rome's new ally. In 1389, it was the turn of Venice, which was at war with Mamluk Egypt over Cyprus and was unable to offer resistance. By 1391, the entire Peloponnesus and the islands in the Aegean were under imperial control, 
and with the conquest of Crete, the Venetians gave up all their possessions in the region. Greece was completely freed from the influence of the Catholics. In the liberated lands, Orthodox monasteries, the centers of culture and urbanization of the time, were restored. During the war, by the way, there was a change of ruler in the empire. The emperor became John's grandson, also John, the sixth, called the Righteous, in the sense that he carried out significant reform in legislation, as well as increased the rights of townspeople and merchants. The following year, with the support of Poland, John declared war on Bulgaria. The latter had no chance of victory. Within two years, they had lost all their territories, at least in Bulgaria itself. The help of Poland was even redundant. This is confirmed by some written sources, which stated that after the war, John, learning about the damage that the Polish army had caused by plundering the local population, said that calling them into this war was a mistake. Well, even great rulers make mistakes, and he was only 17 at the time. In any case, it was a success. Rome reached the Danube River, the ancient frontier of the empire, and the empire itself began to be spoken of again as a great power. Its neighbors, Hungary, Bosnia, Naples, and most importantly, Genoa, even formed an anti-Roman coalition for a time, fearing their further expansion. This gave an impetus to the development of local trade and the reform of commerce. Bureaucratic restrictions on commercial activity were reduced, and burgers were exempted from paying taxes for five years. This quickly yielded results. By the next century, their net profits had almost tripled. As I have already said, John during his reign generally relied mainly on townspeople and cities, and the privileges and autonomy of large landowners, on the contrary, reduced. The same tendency, by the way, was seen in the following rulers of the empire. The reason was quite simple. They hindered the development of the state. During the non-existence of Rome, and then a century of constant crisis, and in general since the 10th century with the emergence of the theme system, the local landlords have become much more like European feudal lords, had their own militia and were virtually independent of the imperial bureaucracy. And although the fusion of military and civil power on the ground, which was characteristic of feudalism, was effective in hard times, by the 15th century, when the existence of the empire was not threatened, this fusion began to be fought. Because of this, the army suffered for a long time. It suffered in terms of numbers. The Roman army at the time consisted of the aristocracy and volunteers hired mostly from the countryside the abode of landlords who did not support the new reforms, to put it mildly. So its numbers for a long time did not exceed the pre-crusade indicators of 50,000 people, and about 250,000 in the 11th century there was not even a talk. However, the armies of the Europeans were the same, and the neighbors of Rome were still small countries. So a small army didn't prevent them from waging war. In the first quarter of the 1400s, this army secured a series of easy victories and conquests, occupied Dobruja, a former vessel of Bulgaria, defeated a major Bulgarian uprising, plundered Kiev in revenge against Poland in their war against the Ruthenian states, took the Serbian territories from Bosnia, the city of Dracum and Ionian islands from Naples, finished off Bulgaria, subdued Ragusa, a trading republic on the Adriatic, destroyed the small bailiffs in southwest Asia Minor and conquered all the non-Genuese possessions in the Crimea. Benefiting from popular support after these successes, new reforms were carried out as usual, particularly a reform of the tax administration, primarily in the countryside. After the second war with Naples in 1419-22, the empire took Apulia from the first, thus gaining a gateway to the Adriatic and a bridgehead for the return of Italy. This is where Europeans, primarily Italians, got nervous. This event caused them mixed feelings. If the return to the empire of the Balkans did not surprise anyone, after all, these lands have been part of it, one might say, forever. And they did not care about the Orthodox living there, 
The southern Italy was lost by it in the 11th century and had already entered into the western cultural world, so to speak. And there, in the western cultural world, was the beginning of a trend to return to Rome, the very Rome of antiquity, with its philosophers, art, politics, science and everything else. A return to man and humanity. That's right, I'm talking about the Renaissance. And in then Rome, after the return of Constantinople, there was exactly the same turn to antiquity, to Hellenism, known as the Paleologan Renaissance. And under John VI, this trend only intensified. For example, one of the emperor's advisors, the Albanian philosopher Julian Iagares, had read the classics and proposed a return to polytheism and the organization of a state in the manner of the Platonic Republic. In the last century he would have been burned as a heretic, and that would have been the end of story. He, on the contrary, led a delegation to Italy as the empire's cultural representative, which included many famous artists, philosophers and theologians. He also carried with him copies of the works of ancient philosophers, all kinds of paintings, statues and so forth. The purpose of the delegation was to show that the empire, if not superior to them in terms of culture, then at least was with them, so to speak, on the same wave. That they were the very Rome to which the Italians aspired. Of course, this statement was not very close to the truth. Take for example the official language of the empire, Greek, which was not like Latin languages. And nobody actually spoke Latin since 7th century. In any case, the delegation was successful and gave its fruit. Italian states were divided and no united anti-Roman coalition was formed, at least not yet. And strong diplomatic and cultural ties were established with Europe as well. Thanks to them, in 1434, the technology of a printing press found its way to Constantinople and the first state printing house was opened which gave the solution to a problem which had been haunting the educated people of the empire for a very long time, for about 400 years. And the problem was that the Greek colloquialism, used in everyday life, differed from the written language to such an extent that they could be called different languages. So how did the printing press help solve this problem? Well, here is how. The printing press makes it much easier to create literature and therefore increases literacy rates, which means more people can get those loosey elites to stop using the archaic written language by distributing books in vivid vernacular. The process stretched on for another century though, and we'll go back to the 15th century. Nothing now hindered the empire in its war against Genoa for control of the Black Sea. In 1427, with the support of Poland, the emperor declared war on them. Genoa was supported by Naples and Milan. After quickly capturing the overseas possessions of Genoa, by which time the Roman troops had already acquired decent artillery, they defeated the Milanese troops in Ragusa and began to chase the retreating straight to Milan. By land, because the combined power of the fleet of Genoa and its allies was higher. There they finished them off and began laying siege to the Milanese cities, with their subsequent sacking. In the process, the Poles joined the party, sacking the city of Milan itself, then the largest city in Italy. In the aftermath, because of these lootings, Milan would lose its status as a major power in the region, and the idea of sacking cities that would not become part of the empire after the war would be integrated in imperial military tradition for at least another century. Having finished with Milan and shaking off a good tribute from it, the imperial army began a siege of Genoa, demanding recognition of the de facto transfer of their dominions to imperial control. The Genoese did not agree, and only with the fall of the city and, uh, yes you guessed it, its sacking, did they acknowledge the new reality. The Aegean and the Black Seas were liberated from the presence of Europeans, and the huge amount of money and various valuables looted by the soldiers, most of which they kept for themselves accelerated the development of agriculture, as strange as that may sound. As I said, the soldiers were mostly former peasants, usually second or third children, and they spent the money they got from the military campaigns 
to buy land from the landlords. This allowed for the cultivation of previously abandoned land. In addition, the state itself attracted settlers to Asia Minor, because it was preparing to expand eastward. At this time, the Ottomans' main ally, the Golden Horde, was just in a state of civil war, due to the termination of the Chinggisid dynastic line, and the Ottomans themselves, while beginning to feel the power vacuum created after Timur's death, were not a problem. At this time, John died, and Thomas de Pius, a generally good ruler, ascended the throne. Six months later, he declared war on the Turks for the liberation of lands lost by the empire back in the 11th century. Imperial troops invaded their possessions and, meeting no resistance, occupied central Anatolia while the Poles fought the Horde. However, having relaxed from ease of war and having sent half of army on the Balkans, Romans have suffered defeat in battle. After that defeat, a peace was made with Ottomans, by which these territories were liberated. Well, I wouldn't exactly call it liberation. If one could say so about the Greek-populated territories of Trebizond, then central Anatolia had been already Turkized, and more importantly, Islamized by that time. And replacing Islam with Christianity is considerably more difficult than doing the opposite. Because explaining to a person that a new patch, so to speak, was released on his religion, forbidden to drink alcohol and eat pork, and forcing him to pray in the direction of a certain part of the world, I am exaggerating now, but you understand, is more difficult than telling a person that this patch was a hoax, and that he had spent his whole life wrong. So the methods that different parties used to convert people from one religion to another differed as well. Islam used methods of non-violent coercion, increased tax rates, a ban on holding any political office, owning weapons, and so on. That is, ordinary people lived tolerably well, in fact. And in the territories reclaimed from the Ottomans, where the Turks had been ruling for centuries, a third of the population was still Christian. The Christians, in our case the Orthodox, did the opposite. The ordinary people were forced to change religion under threats of dispossession, deportation or murder, so that the imperial army often had to suppress the local Muslim riots. But in politics and the court, the talented Muslims got without problems. So in Asia Minor, a process similar to the Spanish Reconquista began. A gradual reconquest of the former lands of the empire with subsequent Romanization and the Islamic world responded by forming a defensive alliance against them. So for another couple of decades, the empire did not turn its gaze to the east, especially since Europe was far more interesting. During the reign of Thomas, the Roman armies in the Polish wars managed to plunder Rus, Bohemia and Germany. Not very pious, but what can I say, the specifics of the time. In addition to European wealth, European ideas continued to flow into Constantinople. The idea of commercialization, which had already conquered Europe, began to seep into the empire. And what is commerce? Commerce is trade, is banking, and everything that makes a profit. It may seem commonplace nowadays, capitalism is at full force these days. But for Christianity, giving money at interest was considered a sin and a rich man who was not a nobleman was in fact a sinner. Nevertheless, times were changing, and attitudes toward money were also changing. Money was no longer just for survival, but a tool for making even more money. Money as an end in itself was the new motto of the rich. And at the cutting edge of this progress was the Republic of Florence succeeding in everything from banking and manufacturing to architecture and art. It was with them that Constantinople took the example, when it created new laws. The commercial codex was, one might say, almost entirely copied from the Florentine, and the local laws of self-government of the Republic were combined with the imperial bureaucracy, giving rise to an excellent system of municipal government, still very long unmatched in efficiency. The empire as a whole enjoyed peaceful times. During this time, Thomas improved the overall professionalism of the army by establishing an officer's school at Constantinople and what we would now call a staff, 
where the course of war was planned in advance, and the coordination of troops located at different ends of the empire was carried out. The new army tested itself in the offensive war against the Turks, which began as early as 1467 and ended under the new emperor John VII, distinguished from his father by his love of war. Having won the decisive battle of Rizayon, the Roman army drove the Ottomans out of Asia Minor. But the Muslims were still in the region, in the form of the Mamluk Sultanate, the empire's number one enemy for the next century, which had seized land from the Turks. But the empire was not going to war with the Mamluks yet, they were too strong, while in Europe they could fight without too much trouble. In the two wars of 1471-73 and 1483-86, the army marched on Naples, taking from them, so to speak, a sock of the Apennine Peninsula and then Naples itself, and between these wars in two years took from Hungary the rest of Serbia. In 1478 they repeated their legendary tour of Bohemia. In 1487 the war of Poland against the Ottomans began in which Rome entered as usual. The war passed without noteworthy moments. Rome even gained some land in Armenia. But we are interested in what this war revealed. By this moment, as you may notice, the empire has expanded quite a lot. And to get from the newly conquered Naples to Trapezon, traveling by the optimal way, by sea, there were no decent roads even near the capital, let alone the provinces. It took two months. A lot can happen in two months, besides it's a journey only from port to port. In general it was becoming expensive to drive an army from one end of the empire to the other. The obvious solution was to increase the number of troops, so that each army was stationed in its own region, and only in case of great need would move to the other. And to do this it was necessary to change the way the army was recruited. The necessary reform of the army began under John and was completed under his son Procopius. And its essence was this. Instead of waiting for a volunteer to enlist, the army itself would come to the potential soldier, usually in a pub. At the same time as this reform, a new system of army ranks, independent of nobility, was organized, which Together with John's complete liberation of peasants from hereditary obligations to landlords ten years earlier and earlier reforms, created a remarkable instrument of social mobility and gave the empire a room for further expansion. In the process, the army tested itself on the Mamluk Sultanate, which at this point was in internal political crisis and had insubordinate vessels on its borders. Because of this, the Roman army occupied their possessions in Anatolia, meeting almost no resistance. But the most interesting thing happened next. While the Mamluks were gathering forces for a counterattack, the Romans loaded onto ships and landed directly in Egypt. Exactly what the Crusaders wanted to do in the Fourth Crusade, by the way. First they plundered the coast, and then they reached the capital of the Mamluks the largest city of the Islamic world, Heliopolis, then called Cairo, and plundered it as well. The war continued for another two years until the Mamluks agreed to the terms of Rome. But the Mamluks would not recover from this blow. And no wonder, only according to official data, after these lootings, the treasury of Rome was replenished by seven annual budgets of the entire empire and the soldiers took to themselves at least five times more. The money received went to complete the reform of the army. And just in time, Procopius wanted to capture Rome, the ancient capital of the empire, by 1500, around to date after all, and the army of a new type was needed for the war with the superior enemy, because Poland could not and did not want to fight against the head of its church. And France, which at that time effectively controlled the Pope, was preparing to defend him. The Emperor personally led the attack on the Eternal City, and in three months he occupied it. The first Rome was not spared by time even more than the second. In the city lived only 30,000 people. 
The city, of course, was not violated after the capture. Procopius forbade the army to plunder it. The French, who were to come to the aid of the Pope, instead attacked the empire through Illyria, and the emperor, leaving part of the troops in Italy, hurried to fight them back. Having defeated the army of the French king, the emperor forced him to acknowledge the return of Rome to Rome. In honor of this victory, the city was renamed Ionia Polis, meaning Eternal City. Then the empire took from the Tumerites, who by some miracle had preserved the land in the region, these weary lands, and finished off Naples, second Genoa again along the way. In 1511, the Second Roman Mamluk War began. The course of the war was almost entirely repeated, except that the troops now reached Egypt on foot looting Syria and Palestine along the way. After the second second of Heliopolis, the Mamluks recognized the empire's sovereignty over Syria, nearly nine centuries after its conquest by the Arabs. Procopius, who at the time was still leading the army, decided along the way to conquer Georgia from Ottomans. But during the siege of a fortress in the mountains, he caught a fever and died. That is why emperors usually did not lead armies. Regent under the young emperor John VIII was his mother Irene Karadzas. During her reign, the country not only did not fall apart, as it often did, but even continued to develop. Under her reign, for example, the construction of the capital in Constantinople, the future administrative center of the empire, began. Oh yes, the war with the Ottomans ended with the liberation of Georgian and Armenian lands. Under Iran, there were also two more wars. First against the Pope and France, in which the French suffered another defeat, and then the war against Sicily, which was a vassal of Aragon, which was a junior partner in the union with Castile, which was an ally of France. Yes, you got that right. France had broken the truce, and all these guys ended up in a war against Rome. The balance of power was, to put it mildly, not on the side of the empire. Besides, one third of Roman troops were engaged at the time in suppressing rebellions in Asia, and everybody was sure that this alliance would win. Yet, the Imperial Army first defeated several armies of the French vessels and then won a decisive victory at the Battle of Amiterne, defeating a threefold large coalition force led by the French king. This victory was a triumph for the Imperial war machine and the May Europeans realized that even a coalition of the two strongest Catholic powers was not enough to defeat Rome. Europe began a process of copying the Roman model of army, which was not successful for a long time yet. Because one could not copy only tactics and weapons, one had to copy the whole state system and, so to speak, take the army away from the nobility. Although the war lasted another three years, with both victories and defeats, that battle was decisive. As a result of the war, Sicily was returning to Rome, and Europe lost access to the eastern Mediterranean. The loss of European traders, especially the Spaniards, to the lucrative trade with the east through the Mediterranean, spurred them to develop oceanic trade through Africa. This war also had a significant impact on John VIII, who became a full-fledged emperor during its course. Imagine that you are 14 years old, you are the ruler of an empire on the rise, and you get the news that 25,000 of your soldiers defeated 75,000 enemy soldiers. What will you think of? You will probably think that with an army like that, you can fight anybody and achieve something great. Also, consider the fact that you spent your childhood surrounded by the clergy and became a fanatic of the faith. What great thing was there to accomplish? The answer is to restore the Pentarchy. And what is Pentarchy? It's such an ancient concept, developed back under Justinian I. That was for the time a thousand years ago. According to which the five patriarchs of the Christian Church, located in Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem and Alexandria, led the entire Christian Church. Rome has been captured, Antioch has been captured, Egypt and Palestine need only be captured, and orthodoxy needs to be spread everywhere. And that's it, the Great Schism is over. Nevertheless, the idea was, to put it bluntly, unrealizable. 
because the conquest of Rome doesn't give power over the Pope and therefore does not give unification of the churches. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Reformation was starting and a bunch of new independent branches of Christianity were appearing, making the original idea all the more unrealizable. But since the concept practically coincided with the general course of expansion of the empire, it became John's goal. A special organization of evangelicals, much like the Spanish Inquisition, Inquisition was established in 1530 to spread orthodoxy, and much of the money spent under John's predecessors on all sorts of idlers and freeloaders, artists, sculptors, philosophers and so on, was diverted to finance this organization. The Renaissance was coming to an end. In the same year, the Emperor declared a holy war against the Mamluks for the return of Jerusalem and Alexandria. The Romans again marched through Palestine and Egypt, plundering everything in sight. After that, their army went to Tunisia and looted it too. At the same time, John declared war on Hungary, and then, after defeating its army, on Croatia, because uh, he could afford it. The war with the Hungarians ended first, after the Romans sacked Venice, then part of Padua, an ally of Hungary. Much of what the Venetians had once stolen from the city during and after the Fourth Crusade, such as the sculpture of the Tetrarchs, made in the 4th century and depicting the four core emperors, was returned to Constantinople. According to the peace treaty, the new border with Hungary ran along the river Drava. Two years later, Croatia was annexed, and another year later, most of Egypt, at least its population, as well as Libya and Palestine. The Christians finally regained the holy city. Now all the cities of the Pentarchy came under Roman control, as John wanted. But since the liberated territories were inhabited by Muslims, the evangelicals needed to do missionary work there, so to speak. At first, the locals strongly resisted the new government and even raised a major uprising, which had to be suppressed by the entire empire and the idea of creating a pentarchy was postponed for a couple of decades. Moreover, after these wars, by 1540 there was formed the first united anti-Roman coalition between East and West, which seemed to be hanging by a thread. To maintain diplomatic relations at such a distance was a very impractical task. But no, it lasted 8 years, and probably would have existed even further, if not John, tired of waiting for the coalition to collapse, finally declared a war against them. And the war was going pretty well in general. In the east, the empire practically only defended itself. The local corps captured just one border fortress in Armenia and concentrated its main forces on the west and successfully took cities in central Italy. The emperor gave permission to plunder cities and only the general commanding the local army saved Florence the center of the declining renaissance, from plunder. He was such a lover of art and architecture that he ordered the city not to be touched. Then he and his army sailed to Tunisia and ruthlessly looted it. Such a double standard. In general, the war lasted four years and ended with the conquest of the lands I have listed and showed that the army should be increased even more, because the troops in the east were clearly insufficient and the Arabs had a significant advantage there. In the same year, the fourth war with the Mamluks began, as a result of which Tunisia lost territories in the eastern Mediterranean, which now became the inland sea of the empire, and Egypt was fully occupied. After this victory, John solemnly announced the restoration of the Pentarchy. The rebuilding of the Temple of the Holy Sepulchre, the largest church in the world at the time of its completion, began in Jerusalem in honor of the return of the Patriarch. In the 20 years since their formation, the evangelicals had had time to reach out to the local population in the conquered lands in the east, primarily in the cities, which were concentrations of local elites. The elites, at least before the rise of nationalism and the concept of nation in general, which happened in the 18th century, were usually the most adaptable and often willingly changed religion to preserve their power and even culture if they got hard-pressed. 
There was an intensified romanization of the population throughout the empire, especially the urban population, most of all in the Balkans and Anatolia, which had been reclaimed first. Although it would be more correct to say Hellenization, because they spoke Greek, but never mind. In this process, by the way, the printing press helped a lot, or rather the monopoly of Greek on the printing of books. Constantinople during this time again became the largest city in Europe, although even more time was needed to return to its former size. However, not everything was as rosy as it seemed at first glance. As I said, the Pentarchy is the five patriarchs, and from the orthodox point of view, the Pope was simply the Patriarch of Rome, first among equals, but equals nonetheless. This, by the way, was the main disagreement between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. So, when the Pentarchy was restored and a new Patriarch was planted in Rome, as in the rest of the cities of the Pentarchy, from the point of view of Catholics, this meant that the Orthodox chose a new Pope. That was, from their point of view, the Antipope. If all the previous antics of the Romans they have tolerated, and even the conquest of Rome, as we have understood, they have swallowed, but the direct interference in religion they could not tolerate. Of course, in many respects the threat was exaggerated, because it would be extremely difficult for Rome to hold the European territories, even if it did conquer them. Well, Italy was easy to hold, anyway. But Europeans had to rally around some cause, because from their point of view the empire was already at the doorstep and had already defeated not one coalition. And although the reformation was underway in Europe, especially in the north, and those Christians didn't care about the popes, the rest were getting ready to reconquer Rome. A new crusade was brewing, in which Spain, France, Hungary, Savoy and Austria were getting ready to participate, while Poland decided not to take part in a future war on any side. Another problem was that during John's reign the church had greatly increased its influence, and in the most important place, in the minds of the people. The fact that the religious authorities in Rome were in communion with the secular authorities was good for the state, as they could use all their advantages for free. But it also meant that it was much more difficult to get rid of their influence on the secular authorities. This led to the suppression by the state of ideas related, for example, to the development of science. However, there were a few centuries before this, and the problem could have been solved during this time. But uh, that's another story. I have told you more than 200 years of Byzantine history, from the moment of its seemingly final fall to the rebirth and the return to its former greatness, with an open ending, because I don't plan to continue, rather than continue. Because making a story about the constant development of something is boring and unrealistic, and making up crises and falls for the country I play for doesn't allow me my perfectionism. But if under this video will, now I will say a totally unrealistic number of likes to not make a sequel, say 15,000 likes, then I will make a sequel. What will happen to the Empire you can think of yourself and write your thoughts in the comments. Will the Empire beat back the Crusade? Will it stay within the same borders? Or will it try to reclaim the lands of the Roman Empire when it was at its peak? Or will it remember the legacy of Alexander the Great and go east? Or maybe repeat the path of the Ottoman Empire and become the sick man of Europe? There are many variations. You can also write your general impressions of the video. This is the first time I've made it this long. Whether I narrated it too thoroughly and boringly, or on the contrary, I can give even more attention to the details. You get the idea. See you in the next story. Jacob was with you, and with that, I say goodbye.